All right. Well, welcome everyone, and those of you guys that are online, got a good uh, good crew of folks uh, worshiping with us online. So thanks for being with us this morning. So a little inside baseball on Preacher World. Um, it's kind of a it's kind of a standard rule. Never, ever, ever begin a teaching series on a holiday weekend, especially Labor Day, right, where uh, AAA just announced this week that 32% of all Americans are going to be on the road this weekend going somewhere, right? So, uh, but here we are, and, and here's how I'd like you to visualize this, because we are embarking today on what I would believe for the next six weeks is probably the most important teaching series that we've done here at Mount Hope in my tenure. Uh, And I don't believe I'm underselling that because we're gonna step into a space that I think every person, whether you are the most seasoned and mature Christ-following believer or all the way on the other spectrum that you would, you'd say I'm incredibly uncomfortable with Christ, uncomfortable with Christianity. Somewhere on one end, a skeptic, all the way to the other end, a mature believer. What we're gonna be approaching and dealing with these next six weeks is incredibly, monumentally important. We're gonna work these next six weeks on squaring up with the scripture, the Bible. There has never been a book in human history that has had so much impact on the human race. Literally for hundreds of years, among those who count such things, it has been the best selling book of all time. Uh, It has uh, been read and translated in almost every language that has ever existed, people, groups, uh, every continent on which humans live, the Bible has been. And it has reshaped societies and it has shifted human beings. If you think about all the the real significant societal changes over the last maybe five, six, seven hundred years where we uh, democratic governments emerged, where the idea of oppression and justice uh, became an important conversation, where poor people and needy people were no longer marginalized uh, as much as they were, but uh, societal systems put in place to try to help those in need. All of those things emerged from the teaching of the Bible and Christ followers who were reading scripture saying uh, we need to follow scripture and change our cultures. The end of slavery in the western world emerged from, the, uh, the concept of that emerged from Bible believing churches saying the word of God says every human being is valuable. That emerged from the church, from the Bible. Women's suffrage, the, the uh, right for women to vote and the movements towards uh, equality between the genders, that emerged from people studying the Bible and saying we have to change our culture. Modern medicine, the modern university systems, all of this emerged from the Bible. And all of that's not to mention the, the tremendous number of human lives that have been changed, human being after human being after human being, who would tell stories of revolutions happening inside their own lives, hope and joy beginning to emerge where it had not been, uh, reconciliation between broken relationships, marriages healed, all these things that happen in human life, story after story after story, human beings by the millions that have found hope and life in the scriptures. But you know the problem, right? For every person, skeptic to believer, no matter where you are on that spectrum, the Bible is a very daunting book, isn't it? Here's a dirty little secret among uh, among the the church why why I think we're doing this pre preseason game this morning right you know you don't start teaching series on holiday Sundays well this is like the NFL preseason no one's really watching the game it's games anyway but they're important drills to be run important things to foundations to be laid uh, the reason we're doing this friends today the dirty little secret. Even among the most seasoned believers who love Christ the most, who have bought in to the concept of the church, for most even Christians, honestly, they're intimidated by the Bible. You know, everything we do around here is rooted in the scriptures. Every point we make, every decision we do, uh, we, we have and we hold, every, uh, every teaching that we offer, uh, every program, everything we say, what does the Bible say? And we're building it around the scriptures. And yet for most believers, even Christ followers who love the church, their personal engagement of the scriptures, there's a lot of barriers there. You know how I know? Survey says 
Only about 21% of the most mature Christ followers in Bible teaching churches on a daily basis open their Bibles. And when I ask the question, well, why? I hear it time and time again from you right here in the room how overwhelming this book is. You know, it's not just one book, right? It's actually an anthology. It's a collection of 66 different books written by 40 different authors on three different continents spanning literally the writers, their lives span 1,500 years, and they're telling stories that span far more than that, thousands of thousands of years of stories. And it's, it's an anthology that comes together. It's complex. There's tons of history. It's ancient. It's so far back in history. You and I, every one of us, skeptic, believer, we all struggle with the relevance of this book, how can something written thousands of years ago and telling stories that maybe date even more thousands of years back, how can this be relevant to our modern day-to-day life? And so we get intimidated by it. Maybe you read the middle of it and you find there's a lot of really angry stuff in there and you're bogged down. Or maybe you read somewhere in the beginning of it and there's a lot of he and she begat so-and-so and whatnot and you're like, well, why, what's that got to do with me, right? And so the, this book, while it has changed the world, intimidates us, doesn't it? If you're with us today and you would self-identify as a skeptic, maybe you're here in the room, maybe online, and you would say, I don't know about this thing. I want you to hear you're not alone. Every one of us wrestles with, how do I trust an ancient book written 2,000 some years ago to be applicable to me today? And worse, we have to confront there are some things about how this book has been used in history that are horrific. Very flawed human beings wrote this book, no question. (laughs) In fact, when you look at most of them, it wouldn't be a stretch to say most of the authors of the Bibles were flat out fools. Am I right? Did I just like say something you're not supposed to say in church? Look at their lives and their stories and they're messed up, no question. How this has then been taken and some of their lives become examples that people misuse. We have to own that this is skeptical for folks because there are claims in here that flat out deny, or not deny, but deny natural law. They overcome natural law. They, they defy science and natural law. There's miracles that happen in here. You say, how in the world could those things be? Throughout history, there have been power struggles between the church and the state where the Bible's been leveraged against it. And we have to own, friends, that human beings have used the words of this book to oppress other people. In the Middle Ages, the Crusades, the Inquisitions, where they would literally execute entire swaths of people who didn't believe torture them, burn them at the stake. You remember the witch hunts, the witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts in the 1600s? They used this book to justify that. Running simultaneous to the great civil rights awakenings that even began in our country in the 17 and 1800s, the wrestling among Christian churches calling for the end of slavery, the end of oppression of human beings at the exact same time in churches Probably even, frankly, friends, this one in the 1850s. People were using the Bible to justify the continued oppression of human beings. We got to square up with that. The stuff was real, and people have misused it. And we're going to make today an attempt to bridge that dissonance, that it is the greatest book that's ever been written, the greatest anthology of 66 of the best, most powerful, most life-transforming books ever written, and yet they have been, it has, the words have been distorted and misused. We're going to reconcile that today. But more important than that, we're going to go to what does it mean for you? And what is God going to try to accomplish in your life? That was a heavy opener, Shane, was it not? (laughs) Y'all, are you all right with me? You here? You with me? All right, grab your Bibles. Let's go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 55. Let me tell you how to find it if you're not familiar. If you're sitting here in the room, Red Pew Bible in front of you, page 733. If you're at home online, you have one. Uh, It'll also pop up on the screen. Or if you're using your own Bible, just flip it into right smack in the middle. You'll probably find Isaiah. It's somewhere in between Psalms and Proverbs and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. It's a pretty big book. Isaiah, chapter 55. 
And by the way, never be ashamed to use the table of contents if you need. Here's what we're going to find as we read this. Uh, throughout the Bible, the Bible makes claims of itself about what its purpose is. And I realize that's, uh, my argument today, my case that I'm going to make for you today, is a little bit like a used car salesman in Newark, New Jersey, trying to sell the product by the product. And it feels a little weird, right? Because the Bible is going to say of itself what it is, what, what this word of God is. But what I hope you'll see today, and I hope the Holy Spirit will begin to open up your heart and mind to understand the radical importance for you that this word is. We're going to drop right into the middle of the narrative. About 700 years before Christ, 700 BC, there was a man named Isaiah that God spoke through and to. He had some pretty significant visions where he saw God in the heavenly realms and he was able to hear God speak and God commissioning him and sending him to preach the word to a people that were in a lot of political chaos, a tremendous amount of societal injustice going on. It was a really dark time in history. Uh, in Palestine. And so God raises up Isaiah and he tells him, go and speak my word to my people. And in the middle of all of that, God says to him, verse 10 of Isaiah 55, this is God speaking through the prophet. He says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without first watering the earth, making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower, bread for the eater. So is my word, God speaking. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire, and it will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Do you see this? God is saying, my word is just like the rain that come down, comes down out of heaven. When, it, when that rain comes, it makes that earth, all those seeds bud and flourish and so forth. And this summer, it's been doing that a lot. Have you seen the overgrowth in your yard? Uh, with all, it's like this, the, the, all the systems work as they should. And God says, that's exactly what happens. When my word goes into humanity, it will accomplish what I sent it to do. And the result in verse 12 He tells us, you will go out in joy and you will be led forth in peace. The mountains, the hills will burst into song before you. The trees of the field will clap their hands. You can visualize that, can't you? That that life is gonna be so full. It's like nature itself is exploding with joy. In verse 13, he says, instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree. Instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. And this will be for the Lord's renown, an everlasting sign, which will not be destroyed. In other words, what he's saying here, when my word goes out, when when you will open yourself to my word and you will hear my word, it is going to land in you and it is going to produce in you joy and peace and abundance. And instead of life being all filled with briars and thorns and thistles, there is going to be um, this, this good fruit that is growing in you. There will be a comfort and an ease to life. Now be careful. He's not promising an American ease where everything goes the way we want it to go. No, what he's promising is in the midst of a life that is filled with chaos and stress and problems and circumstances running below the foundation of all that chaos in life is a peace and an ease that I am in a good place because God is with me and his word is at work within me. This is what God promises to do in his word. Now I have not made the argument nor proved to the skeptic yet that this 66-book anthology is the word of God to us. I won't do that today for the skeptic, at least not adequately. But what we will do over these next six weeks is we will unpack that. How do you trust that this book, this collection of 66 books, this anthology is in fact God speaking? But for this morning, here's what I want to challenge you with is what God promises he's going to do with this in your life. If you'll open yourself to it, skeptic on one end, mature believer on the other, friends, this applies to every one of us. We have to wrestle with the openness of our heart to it. If you will open yourself to it, here's what the Bible, the word of God promises that it will do for you and I. It will reveal to us God. 
that he will show us who he is. It will build for us faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, the apostle Paul said that faith comes from hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the word of God. As the word of God goes into you, as you hear it, as you see it, as you read it, it begins to build faith. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 tells us very powerfully what this word, this scripture will be to us. He says it's living and active. It's not some dead, static, ancient book while it was written thousands of years back. It is, he said, it is living, it is present, it is active. He said it's like a double-edged sword that goes into us and it divides between our soul and our spirit. Here's what that means. That you and I, all the natural almost animalistic, humanistic reactions we have to life, you know, your temper, your emotions that flare, just naturally, stuff happens and, and, and you kind of go there, your red lines that happen in you, those are all things of the soul, the natural tendencies to fear and anxiety, uh, uh, those kind of emotions that when stuff is stressful and we have a tendency to just kind of go there, that's all stuff that our soul does, every human being does it. And the word of God, he says, when you let it, when you let it into you, it's going to be like a double-edged sword. It's going to divide between those natural instinctive reactions to life, between soul and spirit, the spiritual activity of God the Father, what God wants to do in your life. The word of God gets into us, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, and it splits us in half and shows us. It, it, the Bible says in that verse, he says it will discern for us the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. It's going to help us see, hey, this reaction is very human, and this reaction would be what God has for you and me. This is a living and active word that gets into every corner of who, who you and I are. This is what the word of God promises to do. 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us that it is breathed by God. It is God's breath over us, and it is very, very useful for training us and teaching us. And, ooh, we don't like what he says next. Correcting us and rebuking us. The word of God is a perfect two-by-four to your forehead when you need one. It is the thing that will show us, hey, wait a minute. I'm off track here, and God is able with his word to whack you upside the head. You've seen some street preachers who've tried to do that for you. Let the word of God accomplish it, not him. Romans 12 tells us that what the word of God does, it will renew our mind. It will change the way we think. It'll give us a new perspective. This is what the word does. God says, my word, when it goes out from my mouth, it will accomplish the thing that I've sent it to do. It's not going to fall flat. It will do what I intend if you let it. David in Psalm 119, verse 105, he said, It is a lamp to my feet. Your word is a light to my path. It is revelation. It shows me where to go and how to get there. Now, I haven't proven to the skeptic in the room or online that this anthology of 66 books is the word of God, but God has said it. And he says when it goes out, this is what happens. How? Part of your problem with the Bible, written by very flawed men, right? I called them fools a few minutes ago. Maybe that's that's a heresy among church folk, but it is truth, right? You look at every one of their stories, every one of them, like murderers and adulterers and thieves and liars and manipulators. And there's a lot of them, people who chickened out on stuff. I mean, all kinds of manner of foolishness. And here's what God does, friends. Here's the beauty of this, how God revealed himself. Can I say the word idiot in church? Is that allowed? He could reveal himself to these people in the midst of their foolishness. Catch this. God meets them in all their silliness, and he begins to reveal to them something spiritual. He begins to reveal to them a supernatural revelation of something different, and they begin to respond, and something supernatural occurs as a result. And then you and I read about it, and we think, hmm, well, I'm kind of a fool too. (laughs) Jameson, they're not being really, they're they're not enjoying this right now, are they? 
I am. I go, all right. So I look in the mirror and say, I do an awful lot of foolish things. And here I read, oh, you know what? Here's where God meets this human brokenness with revelation. And when followed, here are the supernatural outcomes. And I look at that mess of flawed human beings and how God did supernatural work among them. And I look at that, and that gives me a foundation on which to build a new perspective. That phrase, new perspective, is just a modern way to say faith. It builds my faith because I'm able to see that God can work in the midst of my brokenness, in the midst of all of my foolishness and all of my shenanigans and all of my tomfoolery. I think it's an old word they used to talk about goofiness, right? In the midst of all of that, God can do something supernatural because his word, when it goes forward, it will accomplish what he sent it to do. This ought to be good news for you, believers who love God, but it's still intimidating to you, skeptics who say, I don't know what I can do with this thing, I'm not sure I trust it yet. Here's the good news, it's not really up to you for God to accomplish what he sent in his word. It's not up to you to have everything put together. It's about you opening up your heart and letting him. You say, Chris, if God accomplishes what he wants to have done with his word, then how did all these people abuse it? And how did things that God did not want to have happen occur as a result of his word? People defending oppression with scripture. Well, you know, friends, human beings can manipulate anything. If you're looking for a way to manipulate people, if you're looking for a way to get what you want done, you can use any text. This text, you could use the U.S. Constitution, you could use the Islamic Quran, you could use uh, any writing of any politico, uh, you could use Mein Kampf and find a way to manipulate human beings, right? People can manipulate words and lord them over other people. And so people have taken the very words of God, distorted them, abused them, misinterpreted them, applied them for their own selfish gain, and it accomplished evil things. But when you open your heart, see friends, this isn't about you wanting to manipulate and be an evil person, I know that about you. But when you open your heart to say, God, you accomplish what you want, not what I want. You show up with an open heart Baggage in hand of doubts and fear and skepticism. You show up, bring your, bring your luggage of all your fears and doubts about the Bible with you. Bring it, but just open your heart and say, God, you do your thing, and I'm going to give you room. And he promises, he promises he will do it. Now, do you know why you and I need this? Back up just a couple verses before the promise there in verse 10. Go back to verse 8, where God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Simply put, friends, try as we like. We don't think very well. We think instinctively, reactively, almost animalistically, uh, the emotional reactions and responses to the circumstances of our world. That's just who we are as human beings. And we, are th we don't think with clarity very well. And we certainly do not think like God thinks. And so God says you need this. You need an input that is different. You need a perspective that is different. In all of our foolishness as human beings, we need a God who will supernaturally reveal to us a different way to see it. And if we don't have that input, what are we going to do? 
Keep doing what we've always done. And have you read the newspapers? It isn't working out so good for us, is it? Right? The way we human beings tend to think. Skip all the way back to verse 1 of Isaiah 55. He says, it's an invitation. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters who... You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why spend your money on what is not bread? Why spend your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. And your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. And I'll make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. What God is inviting us to, friends, he's recognizing that you and I are thirsty, that life does this to us. It leaves us in a place of hunger and thirst, all the circumstances, and he says, why? why? You don't need any money to gain what I have for you. You don't need, this isn't about your stature in life. It's not about you achieving something. Just come on, this is the freest gift ever offered to humankind. I'm gonna give you my word and transform you. But why, why would you spend all your labor and all your energy on that? which is already proven to fail? Why would you put all this energy and focus into things we already know will not work well? (laughs) And yet we do that, don't we? We spend so much of our emotional energy and our strength and our day-to-day processing, we spend it doing what we've always done, fretting and worrying and stirring and, and freaking out and, and, and lashing out and, and all these things that we human beings do, myself included. We do this because that's the natural, uh, humanistic, animalistic reflex of our soul and the word of God wants to separate that from us and say there's a better way. There's a higher way. There's thoughts I have that are so much better than yours, so much greater than all those natural reactions and instincts and impulses you and I have. And the word of God wants to get inside us and split our heart in half and say, that's not what you need. Why spend your labor and your energy and your emotions on that which does not satisfy? I have something so much greater for you and it is like a life-giving water just like the rain comes down out of heaven and it waters the earth and makes it beautiful and bud and flourish. That's exactly what I can do in your life. If you open your heart doubts and fears baggage in hand open your heart and say God Do a work in me. Change me. Let your word land in me and do what it's intended to do. Are you willing to do that? And the beauty, friends, and why we're investing these these next five weeks beyond today in a very concentrated effort with a lot of different avenues to help bolster your experience in the word of God It's because no matter where you are on the spectrum, one end a skeptic, not even sure I can buy into Christianity, all the way on the other end of the spectrum, I'm a mature believer, I believe in Jesus Christ, and man, I'm all the way in. No matter where you are on that spectrum, there are different levels and layers of us having our heart ready and open, and even the willingness to engage the word, and we've got to see the promise. If you'll open yourself to it, and you'll invest the time and energy to understand the word and let us help you. It will change you. So around here, you know, we have a favorite slide. We get to this point in the sermon. You go, what in the world am I supposed to do? So what? What am I supposed to do with this? Four things. Number one, I want, I want to ask you to identify where you are with honesty. Now slow down. I imagine online this week there will be friends of ours that will be watching this. We're going to encourage you to send the link out to others that you may know might be interested in this. So there are skeptics who would probably very easily identify themselves. Hey, skeptically, eh, I don't know about this, right? And we've been kind of telling that story online this week and getting some really good responses from people that say thank you for being open to be honest about that. So here's what I want to say to the skeptic who may be watching online or may join us in these weeks to come. 
as a skeptic, your doubts and questions and fears are welcomed and encouraged and be raw and be honest. This is a safe place. You don't need to show up here and act like you believe what we believe. Just come on. Right. You, guys, you guys affirm that? Absolutely. All right. But the vast majority of you in the room this morning and probably even majority that are online with us right now are our regular folks. It's a holiday weekend. Visitors don't visit churches on holiday weekends. Identify where you are with this with honesty, friends. Let's make this a church that it is safe to say I have doubts. You believe enough, you showed up, right? You got enough faith to say, now I'll go to church, and you come most weeks. I know you believe the Bible, those of you that are believers, you believe the Bible to be God's revelation to us, but the vast majority of us, if statistics nationally apply to us here, the vast majority of us are not consuming the word on a daily basis. And you've got to figure out, identify yourself why. What are the barriers? And let's get honest about them. We're, I'll tell you in a few moments about some things, we're, some space we're going to have where dialogue and vulnerability and openness about what the struggle is will help us all help each other, right? And so let's just not pretend. If you're one of the 80-some percent of mature Christ followers who are not studying the Scripture on a daily basis and living from and in and through the Word, just be honest. I'm not, but why? And ha- let us as a community help you go there. Does that make sense? All right, number two. The one thing I ask you to do today is open your heart one click further. Wherever you are, you identify where you are, skeptic all the way to mature believer, and open your heart one click further and just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give God a little bit more room. I'm going to be skeptical of my skepticism. I'm going to open up enough to say, I know I have barriers, but okay, God, if you want to show yourself, you want to be something bigger than God, show me. Mature Christ follower, been in the church 30, 40 years. You say, I know the Bible pretty well. Open your heart one click further. God, what do you want to do in me? Do you want to take me deeper in the word? Maybe you're the guy who's studying scripture or the gal who's studying scripture two hours a day. You open your heart one clicker, click further. What more does he want to do? You hear what I'm saying? Just say, God, do something. Reveal something. Plant something powerfully these next five weeks. Third thing. Choose to seek him. Choose to seek this out. If you still have Isaiah 55 open, you'll see verse 6. It'll pop up in the corner of the screen here. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. That is the whole point of this. God says, I will let my word accomplish. It will accomplish what I sent it to do. But you and I have to open the heart and we've got to look. We've got to seek him. Seek after him. And the fourth thing. Let me, let us help you. That's what this series is about. And here's what we're going to do. Starting this Thursday night, 7 o'clock, right here in this room, Thursday night for the next five Thursdays, we're going to gather in a more interactive space where we can talk about this stuff, we can go a little deeper. We're going to put some of the nuts and bolts together uh, on on how to make, you know, give you tools, how to make this a vibrant experience in your life. And we're going to do it in relational conversation, vulnerability, safety, not weird vulnerability, just safe vulnerability. Let's be honest. Let's level the playing field. We're all skeptic to, to believer. We're all in the same place, and we all have the same questions, just in varying degrees. We're going to get real raw and honest about that and go there together. Okay? Uh, if you want to participate online, we will have a Zoom function for that. Uh, I need to know to send it to you. Uh, so I will send it to everybody who's on a regular email list. Uh, if you're not getting that email list, uh, visitor card in the pew in front of you, fill it out, legible handwriting. There's a couple of you that I missed getting you on because your handwriting's not good. Um, so uh, if you're not getting that, let us know. If you're online, uh, just in the comment, give me your email address or uh, shoot it to us, whatnot. We'd love to get you included in that. So we got Thursday nights coming up. The next five Sundays, we're going to be hammering this. Um, we're also a week from tomorrow, so uh, on uh, what is it, the 12th of September, uh, we're going to be releasing every day during the weekday for at least a couple of weeks, maybe the whole series, uh, a little six-minute video every day to uh, come with me 
as I do my time in the Word of God and go a little deeper. going to model it for you. Walk with us together. So Dave Firestone and I have been working. We've got two weeks in the, in the can on this, that, and if it keeps working, we'll get those put together for you. Uh, so we're going to do a lot of stuff to come at you, multiple directions, um, to help you get there and help you grow and help you have faith and answer the questions and the toughness and make sense of this whole thing. You with me? So that's our preseason game this morning. That's where we're headed and why this matters. Ryan, worship team, come on up. And uh, we're going to worship. So the four things I ask you to do during this closing song. Get yourself centered. Where are you with the Bible? Your daily presence in the Bible, believer. Your even openness, trust to the skeptic. Where are you? And will you open that heart one click further and say, God, do something powerfully. Will you seek him with your heart? That's a decision you make in these next moments. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promise that it will, in fact, accomplish the very thing you intended to do. And so, God, we ask you to do that in these moments, that you would take this promise of Isaiah 55 and that you would land it in our heart, that you would begin to open our heart and our faith. Help us, God, to see it and to trust it and to take a step in our heart towards you. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, let's stand. Let's do a little bit of business with God, and I'll have a closing thought in a moment. Thank you.